Hello, and welcome to Sociology 101 Google Hangout. Uh, I have a guest with me today, uh, Kevin Henderson, who some of you may recognize. He has been on quite a few of our Hangouts in the past, uh, is a regular uh, commenter on Facebook and social media. Um, he is also a Christian rapper, Kevlar the Christian rapper. That's what he's kind of known for. He's one of those cool guys. It's good to have some cool guys on the traditionalist side for once, Kevin. You know, a guy that has... <laughs> Some street cred, if that's the right way to even put it anymore. That's probably not even cool to say street cred, is it? <laughs> uh, uh, Sometimes, a little bit. A little bit? Is it a little bit, a little bit cool? A little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I mean, good. I, I've had my throat slit, so that's a little bit of street cred. <laughs> what? You've had your throat slit? <laughs> yeah, I have genuine bona fide cre street cred. Oh my goodness! Well, is it a long story or is it a short story? No, 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 no. It's it's a long story. It's part of the testimony stuff, you know. I mean, uh, okay. Well, I have well, the well, I'll have to, I'll have to. I'm not much of a jerk anymore. <laughs> I'll have to have you back on to tell that story. That makes me really interested. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you survived. I'm glad you're yeah. here. So am I. Oh my! In the providence of God. How, how long have you been um, a rapper? Man, man. Uh, let me think. Let me think. Maybe, maybe 10 years, years? 10, 10 years, something like that. Now, if how, not how, did, that. How, how do you get into the, something like that? How do you start doing that? Oh man, it's, oh, man, it's testimony kind of thing. I was, I was a secular artist before. I mean, I, I was a rapper because of Eminem, you know, the white guy, right. white guy rapper. Oh, yeah. I want to be a rapper now because he's cool. Um, and right. so I started rapping like Eminem. And then uh, and, uh, I was a, I was a really really bad guy, really really bad but guy. we were in the back yeah, we seat of the Honda, Honda, and uh, we were and getting high. We were getting high, and this random, random quote unquote random gospel hip hop song came on, and it talked about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and I was like, oh whoa, for some reason I believed it, and uh, I just got saved, and. Instead of being a secular artist, I, I was just like, from now on, I'm going to rap about God for the rest of my life and just run after Jesus for the rest of my life. Um, and it was a drastic, you know, I mean, Paul and Damascus Road, Jesus didn't show up visibly as in a light, but, you know, his love was spread abroad in my heart. And I was like, yeah, praise God for this. Um, and that's how I got into rapping. And I, I went I went all over the world rapping the gospel. Um, missionary stuff. Uh, I ra I was probably the one rapper who would go into bars, um, and cl nightclubs, th and they didn't know I was a Christian rapper, and just start rapping about Jesus. <laughs> um, and yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah. So, how did you get involved in theology, especially soteriology? I'm I'm interested how you maybe came across the theology 101, um, and and got involved with us. Well, um, I got saved a long time ago, and um, I wanted to, I, I needed to go to Bible college, right? I didn't know any Christians. I was like the only Christian I knew, um, and I just had this hankering to go to Bible college a long time ago. And um, I, went, I went to Bible college, and the first time, and somebody opened up like, a, a parable to me and what it meant in that context, you know, like you know, in the Greek and the Hebrew, I was like, that is amazing that that means that. I love this. Um, guy named Lanny Hubbard. He's uh, my old uh, theology professor, uh, New Testament survey. And ever since that, uh, I learned how to do hermeneutics and exegesis. And I, I, I loved the Bible and I loved theology and I loved digging in the depths of what things really mean you know it can't mean something different today than it meant to them it can apply different to us but it doesn't mean something different and when you understand what it meant then it's so cool you know and i mean and, yeah. the people the people who aren't christians and they hear about like the blood of the lamb and they hear about these things that we talk about um and when you tell them how it makes sense in the bible with the old testament you know you place the blood on your it, it, they're like, wow, that is actually pretty interesting. I like that. And they're unbelievers and you know, the intellectual rigor of just Christianity itself is cool to them, you know. And I, a lot of people have came to Jesus because of those, you know, those, you know, not just surface level uh, kind of things. And 
just theology in general I, I loved and I only got into the only you know deep stuff I could find was reformed theology um and I just knew limited atonement wasn't true um and I just I, I'd read these passages and I'm like man it, it can't mean what they're saying it means because that's not the way God is in these other revealed passages so I I, I can't figure uh, this out um and I believe the the texts though um the hard texts and I I, I just couldn't understand what they meant. Um, I like why Jesus was blinding people, you know, and stuff like that in the Old Testament, some hard, hardcore passages in Romans 9. Um, but Romans 9, I never thought people had to stay reprobates. I, I never, like, even reading that, just a surface level of it, I was like, uh, people aren't just raised up, so, you know, God doesn't make people wicked so he can send them to hell. It, it, it just doesn't mean that, you know, I believed it, but it didn't mean that to me. Um, Nobody had to remain a reprobate. Um, but then I watched uh, um, one uh, your debate with uh, James White on the Romans Nine thing, and I was like, "That's it." <laughs> I mean, because uh, people say that uh, you know Romans Nine is the key passage for um, you know the. I mean, they have to make everything fit Romans Nine. A Calvinist has to make everything fit Romans Nine. You know, they have to. <laughs> To that one verse, you know, they have to make it fit that everything. Um, and that's their key passage. But actually, Romans 9 is the key passage that is awesome. It's the key passage for us. <laughs> actually, you need to know Romans 9 in order to understand that God loves everybody. You know, it's not about God raising up people to kill them and send them to hell. It's actually, if you understand the real meaning of that passage, it's awesome it's just the flip side of what calvinists say it means it's like the exact opposite uh, even though they use you know jesus blinding people as god hated them but actually he loved them <laughs> and he was cutting them off you know to grant salvation to the gentiles um but anyway I, I watched that debate and then like a lot of your listeners they're like i just binged on what you said you know for a while i was like man that is it I just couldn't verbalize it right, you know? I knew that's what it was, um, but I couldn't verbalize it. And the thing, the way you verbalize certain things was like, that makes sense, you know? And a different perspective that makes sense is good, you know? And, and I wasn't in a cage stage anymore of my own theology, and I was like, cool. That's, that's how I got to hear. Yeah. Well, cool. That's a cool st uh, story. Um, I, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, either through the debate or uh, some of their online meetings or book or something, where uh, a lot of times they'll say, that, you know, that's kind of what I already thought, you know, but it wasn't until I listened to you or, uh, you know, I read your book that I realized there are other people who think the same way that I do. Um, and that really, I don't know what it is about that. I, I, I'm the same way with other people. People, people have said that to me, and I and I say it to guys like John Lennox with the Determined to Believe book because he's a, a well-established scholar and professor, and um, you know with like two PhDs at Oxford and all that kind of stuff. One of the smart guys, and so I read his stuff, and he's saying and has been saying the same things I've been teaching. Uh, for, for years, and for him to publish it, put it into into you know one book, kind of, it's just kind of it's just this validating sense of oh okay that's what that's what I've been interpreting the Bible as as well. That's that's the way I've understood it. And there's something about that. There's something about having fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who are um, on the same journey and reading the same the same the same work that you are and coming with the same conclusions. And that's what it sounds like. You know, you you experience it's your things that you're reading the text for yourself but it was, but it was being validated by somebody else and that you were hearing it uh, iterated um you, 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 you talked about how prior to becoming a christian you know obviously you, know, obviously you went through a stage um you mentioned a cage stage i guess where you kind of where you kind of partly reformed it sounded like you kind of were accepted some of the reformed aspects or some of the reformed calvinistic teachings and maybe and maybe entered into a case of a cage stage at that time and that time and uh and tell us that process of coming out of the cage stage what do you mean by cage stage where you just read everybody read everybody or money to everybody what does that look like what does that look like uh, you're, you're, oh, still you're, you're still muted there, Kevin. 
Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, um, I was passionate about about Jesus and stuff, and I was in a charismatic uh, kind of church, and I, it was real. It, I mean, I love that church. I still love that church. Um, and like I, I heard a uh, uh, Paul Washer's shocking youth message, you know, and I was like, man, that's awesome. You know, he's he's dead serious. You know, and God used that sermon. He, he really did. Um, he's dead serious. And uh, the way Paul Washer was, he was passionate, and he was getting into the scripture and but how how condemning he was of everybody else like you know people who weren't acting like christians um uh a lot of people i was like well i i want to be just like him and so i got really like you're not a real christian if you're not doing this this this, this and you don't believe this this and this and this um and i got onto spurgeon and i got uh jonathan edwards um uh, George Mueller. I love I love these guys. I, I don't like Edwards, but uh like I would only listen to people that these guys talked about. Like um and my father in law was uh previously Calvinistic and there's some good theology in in uh Calvinist authors and stuff. Um and so those are the only books I had. And I was thinking I my my basis was um I want to be used like Paul Washer was used. And the way he was used was he was really, really condemning and very passionate at the same time. And, you know, God raised him up and he's a really deep theology kind of guy, you know, and people followed him and people got saved through his message. Um, I mean, and I think a lot of people have actually got into that stage where yeah. you're not a real Christian. Do you have music, you have music playing, playing, playing on your side? On your side, like on a like computer, 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 your computer, like your computer, like, computer, one, of our, like podcasts, one of our podcasts, like on another screen, like on another screen. I can hear what you're. I, I can hear. Can something. you hear it? Can you hear it? It's the. Uh, why, why, so, why can you be so? Um, there we go. Huh. I, I can't. I can hear it now. And I can hear you a lot better now. You can hear me better than you were before? Yeah, a lot better. Because it was that, that fuzzy. Where? Uh, why you, why you, why you got to be so rude, Theodore? Uh, <laughs> that is weird. I don't know where it's coming from. Hold on. I mean, did you debate those two guys? <laughs> um, I don't have them. Okay, I found it. I don't you got know. it? Yeah, I don't have any idea how that came on. <laughs> Are you guys still able to hear me? Yeah, yeah. Now I can hear you a lot better now. Because uh, it was like that okay. fuzzy thing, but I was like straining. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll just act like I can't hear oh, it. Man, I, hate, I hate that. I'm glad you guys told me. I've got some comments in the side section. Uh, I read it Complagian and several others are saying, yeah, um, my sound wasn't that wasn't doing good. So oh, they could have... do the same thing I could hear probably too, huh? Yeah, that's why, yeah. If if you ever hear anything bad on your end, tell me because it's probably oh, okay. it's probably something I need to reboot. Um okay. so it's it sounds good now. I, I guess <laughs> a ghost <laughs> in the machine, I guess. Yeah, right, right. I said. Okay, sorry about that. I, I kinda yeah. had to interrupt you there, but all of a sudden my iTunes just started playing one of my old broadcasts. <laughs> it was like, What? What did that happen for? I have no idea what caused that. Um, oh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, go on with what you were saying. I'm sorry to interrupt um, you like that. <laughs> uh, so you get, uh, you get into this cage stage, um, where, you know, you're the only real Christian because you're so passionate and you really want to read the Bible. You want to be serious. And you're in this church where people haven't, um, you know, they haven't heard these sermons and stuff. They haven't heard these deep theological sermons and, you know, you, you approach people as if they already have heard what you're hearing and they just rejected it, you know, and they're just off, off there, you know, just hating, you know, denying God and doing all that stuff. But if they would have heard what you've heard, you know, they, they probably would agree with what you've heard, you know, and, um, but got really critical and bitter of, uh, a lot of people, um, like Joel Osteen and stuff. I mean, I don't, 
I don't like Joel Osteen, uh, 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 but he's an encourager. That's that's all he is, man. He's just an, an encourager guy, the milk of the word. That's all. Um, but you know, calling out false prophets, calling out false teachings, like that's your whole your whole ministry is uh, calling out false teachings. But you're not teaching truth, so all you're doing is calling out false teachings. So people are like, where do I go? If everything is false teaching, where do I go? <laughs> um, so that's not a good thing to just call out false teachings and that's all you do um, but that's what I did for a while um, and something happened nobody could have argued me out of it you know out of my criticalness and my bitterness um, I even went to a reformed church for a while um, and it, it was just dead that's that's the one thing that got me and I, I came from a charismatic church and I'm you know all about the gifts of the spirit and stuff like that and I went to this reformed church and I'm like yeah deep theology and I go there and you know it was dead um there was no life in, in the church and uh i didn't really know much about the five points um but because the theology books i read they weren't promoting the five points of calvinism they were just calvinistic and right now people are promoting the five points of calvinism as this is what we need to unify under <laughs> um but I just started thinking deeper about the five points of Calvinism and putting it on my, uh, uh, like, gospel. Because I tell people, Jesus, that's what, say, I, I heard Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the grave. That's the gospel. You know, it's just the gospel. And that's what I heard. And, like, how I thought, how can you say that to anybody if Jesus didn't die for your sins? And, like, what, what you know, I, I took it to its logical end. And I was like, that is false. Logical and false gospel. And I don't think, you know, people who agree with limited atonement think of it that way, or they explain it sufficient slash uh, efficient way. Um, but uh, my, my pastor was a, he was a very higher form, and he was a cage stage, and he didn't know it, though. That's the thing. He did not know that there was so many, that John Bunyan, was, you know, agreed with basically provisional atonement, that Jesus died for the sins of all mankind, um, and that Calvin, you know, did not teach limited atonement, and that all these, you know, Calvinist guys didn't teach limited atonement. He had no idea. He just thought it was orthodox to believe that Jesus didn't die for everybody. Um, and which, it was sad, because I got really critical at him, too, and I'm like, it, just the same way I got critical at um, my charismatic brothers, because he didn't know the stuff I was reading, you know, and I got critical of him, just like I got critical of my charismatic brothers because they didn't know the stuff I was reading. Um, but anyway, I got out of that by a sovereign work of God in my heart. <laughs> um, and nobody could have argued me out of it, but God, God put me through that in, in my life so I could understand that there's such thing as going too far in doctrine and not being practical. And, you know, thinking like what uh, John Piper says, I, I read this one thing and I read this other thing and I push it down to the root and then this is what it is. And I'm like, well, what if your root is wrong? You know, you can't, you know, your logical deductions don't always make sense. Um, and God brought me out of that uh, recently, a couple of years ago, and I found your, your podcast and I was like, yeah, I like this. It's all about the love of God. Thanks, brother. I'm glad you did. I, I know that, you know, we, we have so many passages in scripture that talk about not being divisive. Um, you know, First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.10, of course, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and same judgment. Uh, same kind of thing he said in Romans 16, 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught, avoid them. Um, and, and so many other passages which talk about uh, when, you, when you do disagree, to be kind and, and gentle with one another in those disagreements. Um, you mentioned earlier the fruits of the Spirit as well and um, how we know that those are you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Um, all of those fruits apply even in theological discussions. I would think even especially in theological discussions. It's, it's, it's funny to me how some people 
some Christians can really be careful to practice those fruits if they were talking to, you know, a, a drug dealer or a prostitute or a person on the streets because they're thinking to themselves, oh, I've got to, I've got to win this person over, or I've got to be kind to this person. But when they're talking to their own brother and sister in Christ, it's like they forget that they're supposed to also still display the fruits of the spirit um, in their, in their relationships with each other. Um, and we can become, uh, you know, sometimes very unloving and very uh, unkind when debating uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, on this particular issue. And so well, tell, tell me in your experience, what has been, what has helped you to keep that in focus? Because I know you, you, you've mentioned to me before, that's something you've, you struggle with, and I, I struggle with it too. I went through a cage stage, um, in, both in Calvinism and probably coming out of it too. Mm-hmm. Um, and t- tell me a little bit about in your own experience, in your own walk, what are some things you have to continue to remind yourself of or what helps you in those conversations to keep that fruit of the spirit and to maintain that kind of you know unity, even though you disagree over a, a fairly important issue? Yeah. Um, well. It was, it was more like I, I I thought about how I would react, um, if somebody was talking to me the way I was, you know, I was talking to other people, or um, if you're going on the offensive, um, and automatically, no matter what, the person is going to go on the defensive. You're not going to win anything over, even if you're completely right, everything's right, perfect, you know soundest argument in the world if you're going on an extremely offensive way no not kind not loving not not trying to convince them but trying to beat them um they're going to get defensive um and that's what like that's kind of what got me was um i'm like i want to bring people uh into a deeper theological and more deeper uh, relationship with God and um, a more gracious, loving, kind relationship with God and to be like Jesus. And if I am being just arrogant and, you know, calling people false teachers and stuff, and you're not a real Christian, um, like it just made, it cut so many people, it made, People look at you like, "Ugh, you're 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 bitter, man. You're you're really bitter and critical." Um, and that I I didn't like looking at critical and bitter people. You know, I I you know I go Ugh, if I'd see somebody critical and bitter, and I was like, "Man, is that the way I look? I probably look like that with some of the things I'm saying in the way I'm saying them." Um, and I went from you know, doing that to charismatic people, being critical about charismatic people to now doing that towards a uh, Calvinist <laughs> people. Um, and I was like, I can't just, I need to go right here. <laughs> you know, the pendulum, pendulum went one way and the other way. Um, and I needed, you, you feel like, man, I hope, I hope I can redeem myself from being so rude and being so arrogant for for such a long time one way and now i'm going the other way um and just trying to be in the middle of that and keep the fruits of the holy spirit central to my life because there's no fruit of the holy spirit that is arrogance condemning jerk snarkiness (laughs) um I'm never wrong. Um, there's none, none of those are in there at all whatsoever. So if you're acting like that in the way I was, it wasn't fruitful. You know, there, there was no fruit. I wasn't bearing fruit at all in anything I was doing at all. I mean, you know, you can throw information out there, but if people can't receive it, if, if you say it in such a way that they can't receive it, you're not helping anybody. You're doing anything. You know, people are just going to see Christians as like, these arrogant jerks when we're not supposed to be like that <laughs> at all. And just seeing that um, and I, and not wanting to do that anymore and just humbling myself and admitting it, 
admitting that I did that a lot and I was wrong for doing that and confessing my sin and, and just trying to be as humble as I can about it and admitting that I was wrong in the way I acted and it's wrong for us to do that at all and just admitting it and confessing it and then turning and trying to not do that anymore and be gracious and loving. And well, what's also interesting about that is that it's also more effective. Um, and, and I'm not just saying that like from experience, like I'm trying to give you, you advice or the people listening advice to say, hey, you want to become effective at debating with the Calvinist or any other person you disagree with. Uh, you should try this. This is actually scriptural. Uh, <laughs> Proverbs 16.21 says the sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. So in other words, if you want to increase persuasiveness, according to the inspired text, you must be wise in heart. Um, it says uh, the wise in heart will be called understanding and the sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. That's Proverbs 16.20. So according to the Bible, it is more persuasive to speak with kindness and gentleness. Um, and therefore, if you actually want to be effective in reaching somebody you disagree with, whether it's Calvinism or any other issue for that matter, you're, you're going to get further if you're kind to them and respectful to them. Now, some people interpret that as one of the guys in the side comment over here calling me passive aggressive. And, and I can see that, I mean, or, or fake. Um, I remember the guys at the Bible thumping wing nut kind of did that. Oh, I hate, I hate the way Leighton talks. He just come out, he just be honest, just come out and say what he's thinking. He's over there pretending like he, he really loves us, really likes us. And we know better, you know, he doesn't, he hates Calvinism. He hates all Calvinists. It's obvious that and they were making those kinds of statements. And I'm just, I'm just like, okay, okay. What, what would I have to do to prove to somebody that I I'm, I'm actually not hating them except to be kind to them. There, there are times, yeah, there are times, I mean, it, this happens in my home quite regularly, in fact, with, with three teenagers in the home and one 10 year old and a, a bride for that matter. Um, there are times when, yeah, you, you fake it, so to speak. Um, you don't feel like being nice to the teenager who's been talking back to you all day long. And it's not, it's being an ingrate, even though you provide everything that they own and they're still complaining about something and everything inside of you just wants to, you know, and you have to fake it in a sense. You have to say, I'm going to be calm here. I'm going to be cool and collected and I'm going to speak rationally as a, a parent. That's called maturity. Um, it's called, it's called <laughs> uh, taking your thoughts captive instead of just letting your thoughts just flow right off your tongue without right. uh, controlling your tongue as James tells us to. Um, and so uh, all the things that, that some people consider just being quote unquote fake and passive aggressive and all of those kinds of, of statements. Um, others, if I think they're more objective, can see that more as just being mature and self-controlled. That's what self-control is, controlling yourself. <laughs> That's what self-control is. Uh, as if that needs to be explained, it's pretty self-evident. Right. <laughs> but but that that's that's something that we almost have to tell each other, each other that again. Like we have to remind each other that we we have got to choose to control our behavior and control ourselves, even when we're not real happy with the person we're discussing our differences with. We we may be upset with them, but um, true true mature believer is going to control themselves, control their tongues, and treat the other person with respect, even though they may feel as if they're being disrespected themselves, or they may feel as if they're, they're not being represented correctly and all those kinds of things, you can still be kind and treat each other with the patients and long suffering. And there's, there's a kindness too in, in affirming things Calvinists say and things they teach. There, you know, certain, certain things they, you know, and things they do good at, um, which, you know, I, I affirm a lot of what Calvinists teach, not the five points, but, there's some really good, robust stuff that Calvinists talk about, and I don't, I don't think I've. Uh, and what they do, uh, you know, William Carey, you know, he was a Calvinist, and he's one of the uh, modern mission movement guys, you know, and he he did a lot, and he was a Calvinist. So, but I don't hear that coming this way very much from the Calvinists um, talking about. I mean. You know, and people they agree disagree with theologically. 
um, that they will encourage them in the good things they do for the ministry um, before they go critique what they're doing. They'll just go in and say you're a, you're an idiot because you don't believe this particular doctrine. Um, but I think on top of that, encouraging, you know, encouraging the person. If you're going to debate Calvinism, don't just attack uh, attack them at, or you know, don't just tell them what they're doing wrong, but have a look at the things they're doing right and tell them that too. Um, because if all they think is everything is wrong with me, they're just going to get defensive and not want to talk to you anymore. Um, which I debated limited atonement a while ago. Um, and I think, I think it's a one-sided thing too. If you're a presuppositional apologetic, uh, apologist, I don't think you can have the fruits of the spirit of humility. Um, because humility is being humble enough to understand why somebody else believes what they believe. And if you think they're wrong and you can't understand what they believe and your presupposition is you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. You can't confess. Well, I understand based on a few of those texts and the way you understand them, why you believe what you believe, why you have this certain theology. I understand that. Um, and when I debated limited atonement, I, I was just trying to say, so based on this text, this text, and this, can you understand why I would come to the conclusion I have? And he would, he, no, it, he would just would not understand why I have this. I have, I completely understand why Calvinists uh, affirm limited atonement. I mean, there's, you know, it's logical. There's certain passages, one or two. Um, but and total depravity, I can understand their system. I, I, I know the passages, I, I get it. I understand why people fall into the system. Um, and being able to understand another person's perspective before you debate them is really, is really important. And being able to say you understand them. Yeah. And uh, uh, articulate it correctly and say, this is why, based on these passages and why, how you interpret them, this is why uh, this this is what you believe, right? Well, yes. Yeah, I, I, I would even say you're not qualified to enter into a debate with someone that you can't do that with. Um, and I don't know if, if for all of you theology geeks that like sitting around watching, you know, long, long uh, <laughs> broadcasts that we do here, which some of you are. Um, you know, I did a two-hour pre-debate thing with going back and forth with James White. And in this two hour thing that I did, that's exactly what I did. I said, now here's the way I understand Calvinists understand Romans nine. And I went through my explanation of how Calvinists understand Romans nine. And I asked James White to do the same thing for me. And the reason was, is because in his debate with Michael Brown and in his debate with Steve Gregg, I could tell he wasn't getting it. He was not understanding our perspective. He, he was saying things that somebody who understood the corporate review of election would not ever say or ask. And Steve Gregg actually concluded the same thing. He's, he's, he said, it's, well, it's clear, as, as uh, careful of a scholar and as learned as you typically are, Dr. White, it's clear you don't understand the corporate view of election by that question. And then he explained it to him, but you could tell James White didn't get it in that debate, and he certainly didn't get it in, in my debate. Um, and and that, therefore, he really wasn't ever qualified to be in the debate in the first place. Now, that doesn't mean he's not a quality debater. He's obviously a very good debater, um, very polished in his words, and he always sounds very confident and like he knows what he's talking about. But if you if you know the dis the, the points of the the distinction between uh, the corporate view of election and the Calvinistic view of election, if you know those two things, it's very clear what the points of distinction are, and it's very clear to follow why we're not engaging, because yeah. he's talking about something totally different than what... I'm trying to explain from my perspective and, and that, that becomes frustrating for people who are watching, especially if they're not aware of those points of distinction. It, it looks like, you know, it looks like the person you disagree with isn't even talking about the subject yeah. because they don't even understand what the points of contention really are. And so I, I totally agree. I think, I think it's such a huge, huge benefit. I remember when I debated in high school and later into college, 
the things that was drilled in the thing that was drilled into us is the skill to be able to take on the other side of that debate um, and to be able to represent that other perspective in a clear and concise way. Um, and, and in fact, I've, I've offered to do that with, you know, the Bible bro down guys. Um, we can, we can do it too, if you want to, but just I, I'll put on my Calvinist hat and just say, okay, let me be the Calvinist again. And, and I'll, and I'll show you exactly how I understand, how well I understand, or at least I, you know, I think I understand Calvinism pretty well. I understand there's different forms of Calvinism. And so there's going to be different kinds of Calvinists who argue atonement for, for sure. Cause there's, there's probably good, according to even Phil Johnson, four or five different types of Calvinists with regard just to atonement. Um, which is, which makes it pretty interesting because it's, it's hard to represent all the different forms of Calvinism. <laughs> it's so hard. You can't even say Calvin. <laughs> I have some friends who are Calvinists and it's so hard. They like, they think I'm just so mean. They think I'm so mad at uh, all the Calvinists and I just hate them. And I'm like, no, 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 not, not what you, you, you believe in the full Jesus died for everybody. God desires all men to be saved. I'm not talking about that, man. I'm talking about this, this other thing where, you know, God sovereignly decreed rape. Um, that kind of stuff. I know that's not you. And they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. And I'm like, just take the label Calvinist off, man. You don't have to use that term. <laughs> um, which is hard. And, and my, my debate, in, in my uh, debate on, on limited atonement, I did. Before we debated, I said, I said, okay, I'm going to explain what I believe, and I want you to explain it back to me. And then you explain what you believe, and I'll explain it back to you. And then we can go into the debate. And I had this recorded, right, that we, we recorded. It's on YouTube. Well, not anymore. They killed my channel. Um, but I, I explained, I, I tried to represent his position right. And that God will, what is accomplished by the atonement, you know? It's, that's, that's their way of brushing the scripture aside <laughs> rather than what the scriptures say. What is accomplished by the atonement? Um, and I said, Jesus will save, you know, I, I, Jesus will save the people he died for. And that is your, in a more better way, going to the passages he was doing. And I tried to represent it just right. And he, then he just misrepresented what I was saying. You just get in this bucket and then you're saved. And that's what you believe, right? And I'm like, I, I didn't even want to debate him after that. And it, cause it was so, you know, I knew it, we weren't just going to talk about these texts. We, or we were just, he was just going to marginalize what I was going to say and say, Matthew something, uh, his name shall be Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And then just push out every single other passage of scripture and that, that's it. Systematic theology. Go here, 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 here. My doctrine. Um, and that was basically the whole debate and none of, we, we didn't engage at all. Did he, um. Did he um, hold to the typical Owen perspective, uh, John Owen's dilemma, and uh, yeah, is that kind of a yeah? That's that's pretty common nowadays. I think that's kind of Piper's view, and the heaven he came and sought her is kind of based around that that commercialistic uh, understanding of the atonement. Um, yeah. Which, well, let's let, you know if if you want to talk through some of that, we can do some of that. I know that's been your right. area of study more recently. Yeah. Yeah, view of the atonement. So let me put on my Calvinist hat or more specifically, <laughs> I'll put on my John Owen Calvinist hat because, um, because again, there are different types of Calvinists. Not all Calvinists believe what John Owen taught. Matter of fact, there's a lot of Calvinists, Baxter and, and others, anybody who held to the Lombardian formula for years prior to Owen coming along um, would have, would have disagreed with Owen's conclusions. So I'll be real specific and put on my Owenism Calvinism, <laughs> my Owenism <laughs> slash Calvinism hat. <laughs> And, and, oh. and, and what would be Piperism, I guess Piper would probably agree with or use the same arguments that Owen would use based upon what I've heard him say, uh, in, uh, heaven came and sought her, uh, dialogues on his podcast. So, all right. So here's, here's the argument, Kevin, let's see how good you are at uh, defending against Owenism, Calvinism, and uh, let's see how good I am at representing <laughs> at least this form of Calvinism and see if I'm fair. Uh, okay. So if, if God imposes his wrath and the son underwent punishment. He, if he, if he, he, if he was punished, he was either punished for the sins of, of all the sins of all people. Okay. 
which is what most traditionalist Arminians say, that he was he 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 was punished for all the sins of all men, or two, he was punished for all the sins of some men, which is what Calvinists believe, or, or a more limited version of Calvinists believe, uh, uh, an Owen, <laughs> Owen and Calvinist guy, okay? or yeah. third, he was he was punished for some of the sins of all men. Okay, so that's that's the three options. Either he was punished for all the sins of all men, to all the sins of some men, or some of the sins of all men, in which case it would be said on the first one, if he if he suffered and punished for for all the sins of all men, that uh, if, well, let's start from the bottom. If the last is true, then all men have some some sins to answer for, and so none would be saved. So if, if he died for some of the sins of all men, then nobody would be saved because all sins have to be paid for. Yeah, and so we we would take out the last option there first. And so if the second is true that he only died for that he died as the Calvinists say all the sins of of some men, then Christ is in their stead, and he suffered for all of the sins of the elect of the world, and that would be a true statement of what Calvinists believe and teach. But if the first is the case, then this is the big question that the Owen, Owen Calvinist would say. If Christ did die for, and he paid for and punished, was punished for all the sins of all men, then why is it that not all men are free from the punishment due to their sins? And in other words, there's a double jeopardy problem because if he was punished for all the sins of all men, then what are they being punished for if they go to hell? How, how do you answer that? Um, so this is, this is one I, I could not, uh, for the longest time I could not answer. Um, well, I could, I would say, you, you know, they reject the gospel, you know, but then they have their ways that wiggle around it. Um, well, let, let, let's go through that real quick. So you, if you say, well, it's unbelief because they don't believe the gospel, well, then, then they would ask, well, is unbelief a sin? That's yeah. the way they do it, right? Yeah. And so you would say, well, yes, unbelief is a sin. Well, didn't Christ suffer? And be, wasn't he punished for unbelief too? And you, would of, course, you would, of course, say, yes, he, of course, he, he, he suffered for unbelief too because he suffered for all sin of all men. And therefore, if he already was punished for your unbelief, then again, you have a double jeopardy issue because you're paying for in hell the sin of unbelief. Mm -hmm. And so you're still caught in the same problem. So that's not a good answer, Kevin. Keep going. Okay. Okay. Well, since Jesus, Scripture says, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not only our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And that's in Scripture. So he's the pr propitiation for our sins, or the same way he's the propitiation for our sins, he is for the whole world. And I would say that's the sins against the law, the judicial law. Um, and but why are men in hell? Does does scripture anywhere say that people are in hell paying for their sins? Um, the great white throne judgment says it, it. You know, they're they're. It doesn't say anything about sin. It you know the nothing about that. And since scripture says he died for the sins of the whole world, everything. You have to find in scripture what are men paying for in hell. And personally, I don't, I, um, I, I, I hold to the provisional uh, atonement, but I, I've been trying to dig deeper in, into this, into the scripture. And scri I think scripture forces this that since he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only our sins, but for the sins of the whole world, and not a pr potential uh, propitiation, but the uh, propitiation, that the only sin that wasn't placed on Christ would be the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, scripture says, uh, all the sins of all the sons of men will be forgiven. But he that blasphemed the Holy Spirit hath not forgiven us, neither in this life nor the next, um, nor this age or nor the one to come. Um, and that would be, so what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? And uh, People have different interpretations, but I think it's in Mark and Matthew. Um, it's uh, either calling the things of God satanic, the works of God satanic, or, uh, or rejecting when the kingdom of God comes to you, you reject it. 
And that is a sin um, that you're not born into because it's unforgivable. You can't be born into the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to be born into the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, or you couldn't be saved. Nobody could be saved. Um, and that would that's one possible uh, answer for the double payment argument, um, which I've been dealing with a lot. Because uh, I well, was like, how so, do I answer this? How do I answer this? And so to put it back into the dilemma that, that Owen pushed in the first place is you would ultimately be denying that he died for all the sins of all men. He, in other words, he did not die to pay this for the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And um, as defined by you as being um, rejecting the Holy Spirit's truth for your entire life, that would be considered blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. In other words, continual unbelief unto death would be considered blasphemy of the Holy Spirit from what you're saying. And therefore, Christ did not die. He was not punished for all the sins of all men. There's one sin that he did not pay for, and that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Would that be accurate? I, I, I don't think he paid for the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I, I, I don't think, because you can't be forgiven by it. You can be for, forgiven for everything. You murder all that stuff. And then there's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that Jesus says you can't be forgiven for. So that, I mean, yeah. And, and I, I don't think you can die in unbelief. I don't think I, I don't think you can be living. I mean, you can struggle with doubt and stuff like that, but you have to believe that you have to be believing when you die. You're not gonna. There's no Baal worshippers in heaven. You have to be believing. I don't care what you've done. You just killed somebody. You have to believe in Jesus. Um, I don't think you can die in unbelief and go to heaven. I think, um, but that's. You know, <laughs> this is my own cage of what I've been thinking about. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's scripture. I think scripture forces that position that it's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and that Jesus didn't pay for that sin. I, I think scripture forces that, in my opinion. Yeah. And well, and I, we've argued before. And I think with when Dr. Allen was on the program a couple of times, we went through the commercialistic view of Owen um, where he he overstates uh, the debt metaphor in scripture um, yeah. as, as if it is a one-to-one -one ratio of, you know, the amount of suffering and payment equals the amount of sin. And so if he suffered and died for, and paid for so many sins, then it, it, it only covers those sins one-to-one -one ratio, kind of a, a debt to, to ratio payment. Like he would have got Which, more with more if, I stole a piece of gum or something like it yeah, would, right, it would right. have been more suffering or, like or like in the old Testament, whenever they offered a sheep sacrifice of atonement on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Um, okay. Well, last year there were 500 people that showed up. I'm just throwing out numbers randomly, but, and, and, and so for Yom Kippur, they had 500 people and they kill a lamb for, for sacrifice. Well, the next year, a thousand people show up. Well, okay. Well then do math. You got to have two lambs. I mean, <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it's, it's, it's one of those one-to-one -one ratio that we have so many sins and therefore we have to have so much blood being spilt as, as to cover all each one of those sins. It's yeah. a very commercialistic one-to-one uh, -one dollar ratio, kind of a, a debt payment, um, which is not the way that, that the and sacrifice of atonement have ever been explained. It's always been explained. doesn't say it that way, you know, like. Well, yeah, it's, it's always, it's always explained as a provisional atonement. Um, yeah. the, the, the serpent lifted up in the desert is a, a perfect example of a provisional atonement. And that's Christ's example in Rome, in John chapter three, just yeah. as the serpent was lifted up. So too, I will be lifted up. And in the same way that one was provided, if it's a conditional provision, in other words, if you look to the serpent, you will be healed. So it's a provision that's conditional. You have to look to the serpent in order to be healed. And Okay. What's I, I did a, a correlation with that since the Israelites they went it, it's numbers twenty right that the Israel they got bit by serpents right they 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 had the serpent poison in them and so a serpent was lifted up um and then gee th there's such a the types and shadows because uh, 
uh, I think it's Romans says, and Christ condemned sin in the flesh. He made him who knew no sin, sin for us, that we might come to the covenant faithfulness of God. So they put a serpent up, you know, and they got bit by serpents, put a serpent up, and, you know, they were healed for, from the venom. Jesus, he became sin, who knew no sin, and condemned sin in the flesh that we might cast, you know, just, I mean, the, the types and shadows stuff. There's deep, there's huge things in the, the atonement. Um, but double payment, it, it, it's not a biblical argument either. It's like, it's a, yeah, and, it's just, and, and, and whenever people understand that it, the salvation is, can be at one, and one point, not notorious and that you're not meriting salvation because you're not earning salvation by believing and trusting in Christ. Mm -hmm. um, God is giving you that graciously. He's giving that graciously to those who fear him or put their trust in him. Um, and and he, he, he's not obligated to do that. He chooses to do that graciously. And so um, in the same way, when somebody looks to the serpent, it's not that they're owed healing. It's not that God has to heal them. He has chosen to do so. And it, it's conditionally applied. So if you yeah. look to the serpent, you will be healed in the same way. If you look to the sun, you will be healed. Yeah. Um, and if you don't look to the sun, you won't be healed. And so somebody refuses to look to the sun, just like if somebody refused to look to the serpent and they end up dying of snake venom and they get to pearly gates and they say, well, God, why didn't you provide a, a, a healing for me? And God would say, I did, you dummy. Yeah. <laughs> He'd be nicer than that, but he would... You know, he, would say, he would say, yeah, I did provide it. You, you refused to look to the provision. And I think that's even, there's such more wrath you deserve for that. Your sin put Jesus on a cross. You're going to pay. I, one way I used to do the double payment argument was uh, either get forgiven by it or be guilty of it. Be guilty. You, you know, I, I'd rather you know, go steal something from a guy, um, steal something out of his house, then kill his son. You know what I'm saying? With my wickedness. Um, that was one thing that, I mean, you're probably paying for killing the son of God with your wickedness in hell. You could be. Um, and I think you, you deserve wrath even more. I know he who sins deserves wrath anyway, but that's even worse. It's even more of a condemnation that you've had your sins paid for by the Son of God, and you're you're rejecting it. So that's horrible. What you're, do you say? What do you say to the Calvinist who says to you, Kevin? Well, oh, so you believe God is trying to save people, but He's failing. Uh, oh, He tried to save you. He tried to save you, but He just failed. He 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 can't do it. So you believe in a real weak, namby pamby God who tries to save people, but he just can't. I, try, I tried to save you, I just can't. I, so this is, this is one of the way. <laughs> say, people say, uh, oh, so your God, just, he just, just can't save you without your free will, so he just can't do it. I'm like, no, he won't save you. Not that he can't. No, he won't. That you're, 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 framing the, 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 you're framing the statement. No, he won't save you. You must do this. Not that he can't. You, he won't save you. That's the. There's a different way to phrase. Yeah. Yeah. And that, well, and, and it's also it's like it's it's trying to put onto us uh, effectual grace, and as if we believe that that's what God's trying to do. Like he's he's trying to effectually cause you to want to believe in him, and he just can't do it. No, we 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 affirm if yeah. God wanted to create a Calvinistic world, a deterministic world where he you know pulls the regeneration string, so to speak, on the puppet. <laughs> Uh, I know that's a, a crass way to put it, but if, if he wanted to do it that way to where he sprinkles the fairy dust or whatever way you want to put it, uh, makes you change your heart and your mind to do what he wants you to do, then he could have done that. I mean, even a good computer programmer can you know, program avatars to do exactly what he wants them to do when he wants them to do it. Um, and that that's not hard for God to do. God could have created a theistic de deterministic world where nobody's nobody's denying God could have done that. What we're saying is God has chosen to create free moral creatures and he won't save you unless you trust in him. And so you're exactly right. It's not that he can't, 
he won't. And he so won't. it's not got up there wringing his hands. It's a lot of times the Calvinist, oh, he's just wringing his hands. He just, he just really hopes this will happen. He just can't do it. And he's just so weak and mamby pamby. No, it just like a, you wouldn't say that about a daddy who has a little daughter and he's asking her to go do something and she refuses to do it. And if he doesn't choose to grab her and manhandle her, are you going to say, oh, well, that dad's just not strong enough to handle his daughter? He's just, he's just too weak. No, you're going to say that father had the choice in how he uses his muscles, how he uses his strength over his daughter. He has enough, quote, sovereignty, which means his yeah. ability to do what he wants to do in any given situation with regard to his daughter. He is sovereign over his daughter in the, in, in, in the way he treats her. So he can use uh, reward. He can use punishment or the threat of punishment. Uh, he can use his, his vocabulary and his, the look of his face. He can lose a lot of different means to convince his daughter to do what he wants him to do. And he can allow for her to err and make mistakes and receive punishment for those things. Because even a man, a father has enough freedom over his daughter to choose how he wants to interact with her. He, he doesn't have to be seen as a quote unquote failure simply because he doesn't use brute force to cause her to do something he wants her to do. And you, you're, you're, your father of teenagers, right? Oh, three, yes. <laughs> three, yeah. <laughs> um, one day you're going to let them go, like make your own decisions. You're, you're in my house now. You're going to abide by my rules and, you know, and you'll give them grace to mess up here and there and blah. And one day you're going to let them go and make their own decisions and they will pay for their own decisions. You won't always, dad won't always be there to go, well, I'll pay. All right. I'm going to take care of you now. I'm going to take care of every single little thing. I'm going to let you go. He's going to let you go and make your own decision. And I think that in, in a sense, that's how uh, like age of accountability is with God. Um, children, you know, yeah, yeah, young children, once they've come to the knowledge of good and evil and aren't in, in, a, in a true sense, like God knows, this person knows right from wrong, make your own decisions. Um, and I, I think that's, you, you'd be a good dad to let your you know, grown child make his own decisions um, rather than just babying him his whole, you know, his whole, his whole life. Um, I, I got another one. I got another one for you. Um, there's a Calvinist in the side chat um, and he's making some points along the way. So he's helping, he's helping me put on my Calvinist hat. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so theoretically what you're saying, Kevin, is the cross really doesn't save anybody. Isn't that right? You know what you're saying? Cross really doesn't save anybody theoretically. The, what? No. Theor uh, theoretically, then the cross really doesn't save anybody. If it's a provisional atonement, then the cross is just making a provision for salvation. It doesn't actually save anybody. It makes everybody savable, but it doesn't actually save anybody. Um. Well, he actually saves everybody who believes. It actually saves everybody who believes. See, at the end, so uh, I, I like, I, I had the extended atonement by uh, David Allen. It's one of my favorite books. I love it. Um, but I, I don't, I don't um, separate. Now, after I've been studying this for a long time and going through Yom Kippur and scripture on the atonement and stuff, I think uh, the intent is the same as the extent. The intent of God was to die for the sins of the whole world with the same intent to save those who believe. So I think if one person, if nobody was saved, if Jesus, if God didn't save anybody, he wouldn't fail at all because his intent is not to save those who don't believe is too intense. Die for the sins of the whole world, save those who believe. Um, he didn't fail at all. He died for the sins of the whole world. He accomplished that. Um, right. Well, and, those who believe, and he's and, accomplishing that right and, now. Right. And one of the easiest way to say is, is, is to say back to that same Calvinist who says, so, okay, theoretically the cross saves no one. I could say, okay, well, theoretically the serpent lifted on the pole saved no one. It right. Provided. Yeah. It provided, the, it provided the healing for whoever looked to it in healing. So theoretically, yeah everybody could have refused to look to the provision of healing. Yes. Theoretically, everyone could have done that. Um, theoretically, but yeah. the fact is, is that people do look to the provision of God 
just as they looked to the provision of the serpent and they were healed. So he made everyone savable. This is the false dichotomy. He either makes being savable or he actually saves. No, he makes all men savable, just like he made all of the Egyptians healable or all the Israelites healable. Um, and he actually heals those who look to the serpent in, in faith, just like yeah. he actually saves those who look to Christ in faith. And so it's a false dichotomy to say it's either or when it's both yeah. and. He, he provides provision for salvation of all people, and he actually saves those who do what he says. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and it's really that simple. It doesn't and have I, to I be. Think that's more biblical. I mean, that's it's just being biblical just to. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. If you believe, you'll be saved. Like, died for your sins, was buried, rose from the grave, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, that, that's the gospel. <laughs> that is the gospel. You can't preach the gospel without it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, you don't have... Um, that's well, the and, gospel. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, and the, you... Yeah, well, and the... And the, the, the the weakness of the L of limited atonement is also reflected in the fact that so many Calvinists, uh, and most even would argue Calvin himself, did not hold to the Owen perspective. Um, and so you could turn to Bruce Ware and and other Omraldian type Calvinists, and even Calvin himself, along with uh, any of those who held to the Lombardian formula um, and who who were Reformed thinkers who took on Owen's perspective as a thorough defeating of that commercialistic uh, view of atonement. Um, and so why, why Calvinists stand so dogmatically on that particular point is beyond me. It's not needed for Calvinism. I mean, yeah. it, it's not something you have to, you know, claim to be a Calvinist. In other words, it, it doesn't, it's not needed for the other four points really. Um, and it, it also actually strengthens some of their issues because it removes some of the arguments we have against some Calvinists with regard to God's well-meant offer and all those kinds of other issues. Um, so wh why, why uh, some Calvinists are so um, insistent upon uh, limited atonement as being a, a, you know, a key point in the systematic is, is still beyond me. I, it's, it's, I think it's the, it's the cage stage. I think, I think, um, uh, cause I, the, the people they're probably listening to are, you know, they're really deep theologians and stuff like that. And like James White or something. And they're just, that's all they hear. And they don't realize that there's a lot more Calvinists out there who like do not agree with limited atonement and would consider people extremely high forms who agree with limited atonement. Um, and I think it's the cage, the cage stage. I'm not, I'm not trying to say everybody who agrees with limited atonement is this, you know, reclusive guy. You know, there's biblical arguments for it. Um, and one of them, one passage in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, he became sin, who you know, sin that we might become the righteousness of God. That's one passage uh, where if that meant that every single person that Jesus died for became the righteousness of God, it, it would equal universalism, right? But the hinge, the the word dikaiosune theu in Greek and in Hebrew means the covenant faithfulness of God. And 2 Corinthians 5.20 is talking about the apostles. That he became sin, that we might become the covenant faithfulness of God. That we are faithful to the covenant. Um, not that every single person Jesus died for would become the righteousness of God. Or that we have the righteousness of Christ, the imputed righteousness of Christ, not the righteousness of, of God, which means the covenant faithfulness. Everywhere else in the Bible, it means the covenant faithfulness, not a status which is imputed to his people. The righteousness of Christ is what we, we are imputed, you know, um, but not the covenant faithfulness of God. And that would be another thing I was studying too. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and and I, I do think the you know specifically with limited atonement, I, I do think it's more it is it is more of a logical uh, out yeah. you know outflow of the other points of the system, um, as as even one of the Calvinists commented on it. I think it's the logical. I don't think it's the biblical uh, perspective. Of course, they would argue differently, but it's it's 
it's they feel it's logically necessitated because it makes sense if God's unconditionally chosen certain individuals and he is irresistibly calling those certain individuals that he would have only uh, paid for those certain individuals. But again, like I, like I said before, if you don't hold to a commercialistic view of atonement, um, it, you uh, you know you can argue as Charles Hodge and the Princeton theologians Dabney and so many others did that the the atonement is actually sufficient for the sins of all the world, not uh, theoretically sufficient or hypothetical of sufficiency as the Owen formula necessitates. Yeah. Um, and so when when you just reduce it to the issue of the the intention of of God then it's it's interesting we can actually agree with our calvinist that god's intention is to atone for the sins of believers um and and then the, then the debate becomes more about irresistible grace on how one comes to believe um and yeah, that's yeah. what i oftentimes say okay well i will just agree with the calvinist yeah god intends to atone for the sins of those who believe all right we'll, we'll contend with that now let's talk about irresistible grace and this concept of whether you're responsible to believe or not um, yeah. Or whether God is the one who's responsible to effectually change your heart mm -hmm. to make you believe. Um, that, that And that ch changes the debate over. And again, L becomes a secondary issue uh, once again. Um, and that, that's that's one of the reasons I have not ever you know put a lot of emphasis on that particular um, point because I just yeah. it's just not necessary uh, for for this this point of the discussion. And, and I, I, I re like I was really gung ho about it for a while. I still am. Because there's so much, I, I love studying the atonement and the, because it's so big, that's, that's the Christianity, you know, that's the, you know, that's what we're saved by, the, the atonement of Christ. Um, and, and, because what, the way I preached the gospel for the longest was a really, really simple, First Corinthians 15, now I make known that the gospel preached to you, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose from the grave. And when you only have, you only a, few have minutes, a few minutes to tell somebody the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. This, is the gospel. this is the gospel. Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose from the grave. Believe, and you'll be saved. Um, and so if if that's not true, you don't have a gospel. Right? Like, if you can't say that to somebody with full conviction and know it, you don't have a gospel. And that's why I was, I, I was debating Calvinists because I was like, I was not trying to prove them wrong. I was trying to get them to start telling people to preach. I, I was trying to get them to start preaching the gospel. I just wanted them to preach the gospel more. That was that's why I was so vigorous against it. I'm like, preach the gospel. You're not if you're not saying that, you're not preaching the gospel. You have you have no, you know, gospel. Um but, but well, especially when you understand gospel is good news, because it's not good news to say that um God didn't provide uh, a way of salvation for most of humanity and that they're born in a condition of hopelessness and helplessness. That's not good news. Um, even for those who happen to be a part of the elite group that was ch chosen for a good thing, that's still bad news for us, at least, especially if we have a loved one or a, you know, a child or a, a parent or a, lo a close loved one who doesn't believe then our conclusion is, well, that's really bad news. Many of us, especially if it's our children, we would we would be like Paul in, in Romans chapter nine, one through three. You know, take, take me instead, God. Um, yeah. and, and you know, we would we would want to take their place if if that's really the case. If it's really you arbitrarily picking which people you're going to effectually save and not, then God, you know, take my child. Uh, you know, tr trade me out. That's it's 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 horribly yeah. bad news to come to this conclusion that God is, um, you know, is selecting people from before the foundation of the world and, 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 and the rest are left in a hopeless and helpless condition. That's not good news. That's really, really right. bad news. Right. For, and it's a little bit of good news for a few lucky people, but even those lucky people, if they're like Paul in the heart of Paul, they're actually still grieved over the fact that um, that others are lost and would love to see others, other, uh, you know, more saved. Yeah. Um, I, I, and, I, I think we throw, we throw, throw the term gospel on things too, too much, too, too, too easy. Uh, do, James White, I love James White. These, um, but he throws the gospel on everything he does. He says he goes into Islam or goes into the mosque and he preaches the gospel. He, did, he goes over here and he preaches the gospel. Um, and a lot of people just say they, Calvinists, preach the gospel. And I'm like, so gospel, good news, right? Like what you're saying, there's, what is the news? 
what is the good news? In, in, uh, in Paul's day, euvangelion, that's, it was used in Paul's day, the gospel in uh, Greek, euvangelion, it meant the gospel of Caesar. It meant we have a new, we, we have a new emperor. Caesar is, Caesar is Lord. Um, they, they would say euvangelion, Caesar is, is Lord. Um, that was the good news, but it always came with pay the taxes. His image is on it, pay the taxes at the same time. Um, so for us, Evangelion, Jesus is Lord. Um, he died for your, he owns you. Jesus owns everybody. He died for everybody. He owns all of us. Um, his image is on you. Pay the taxes. But it's good news because he is merciful, gracious, loving, uh, forgiving. He's Lord. It's really, really good news that Jesus is, is Lord. Um, because, except for, you know, people who don't want to pay the taxes. Give your body to Jesus. Um, your, your image yeah, and, 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 and I, like, I like to remind people is that the reason the good news, which is what gospel means, means good news. The reason the good news is good is because God is good. Um, if God's not good, there's no, there's no news that's good. You know, in other words, yeah. the news that we're bringing is, uh, is telling everybody about who our God is. He's a God who would rather die than send somebody to hell. He's a God who, who desires mercy over uh, justice. Um, he's a guy who, uh, he's a God who uh, would, would send his own son in our place to make provision for our, our sins so that all may be saved. He's a God who genuinely desires the salvation of every man, woman, boy, and girl and desires uh, for people to have abundant life in, in him. Uh, he's a God who desires all of these things because he's good. And if, if your version of God is not recognizably good, then how can the news about him be good? Yeah. And like that becomes the point is if we talk about what love is, okay, great. God is love. We know that the Bible says so. Um, but what is love? And unless you define love as the scripture defines love, just like you can't define good, uh, you can't define good as something that is actually unrecognizably good and still call it good. Otherwise you're just saying yeah. we worship, we know not what, you know, he's just some, yeah, yeah. some all powerful demon in the sky. We don't know. He's just, he's just, his different, he's just so different than us. We can't call him good because good doesn't mean anything to yeah, us. Not to us. You we, know, like, yeah. It has to be recognizably good for it to yeah, be yeah. Uh, understandably called good. And that's what makes the good news good is that God is good. And therefore anyone who trusts in him will be saved. That's the good news. Trust in God, follow him, believe in him, and he will save you. That's the good news. Yeah. Um, and he has provided that through the work of Jesus Christ. The, such, the, the, the goodness of it, uh, a part of the goodness of it, I, I, I believe, is like, if you, can't, if you can't say, you don't have to go sacrifice a goat to come to God to get your sin. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to fulfill the law to come to Jesus and get your sin forgiven. This is good news. God has opened his arms to whosoever will come. Um, you don't, this is good news. God has revealed himself to, to us. You know, we know who he is now. This is good news. You don't have to deal with your sin before you come to God. You can come to God to get your sin dealt with. Um, if you don't have that, what, what do you have? You know, what, what, if, it, if God ha isn't capable of dealing with somebody's sin, what good news do you have for them? Even if it's the worst, it, if this guy is a reprobate and God's, you know, he's not going to get saved. He's not going to believe. He, he, he's just not going to believe. Um, like, there's no, there, you can't even start with this is good news. You know, you can't, you can't even, even though it will be bad news for him in the end, because Jesus is Lord, he owns you. He's going to, you know, he's going to do what he did with you. <laughs> but, you can't even start with good news. You just have to start with, well, you're going to hell. There's nothing you can do about it. Jesus didn't abolish the law in his flesh. Uh, Jesus didn't do anything whatsoever. So there's, it's like he didn't even come. There's no news for you. I mean, what? <laughs> just... And that, 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 that was one... Uh, Another thing. In, in yeah, uh, sorry, I started to, to talk. Started to talk with my mute on, like you did earlier. <laughs> um, someone was asking in the uh, in the side chat um, uh, about uh, 
um, I was trying to scroll back up so I could actually read what he asks, um, just so that I could answer it verbatim. Um, he was, he's ultimately asking, do atheists know God's goodness? And my answer to that question is to refer to Romans chapter one and to say, for what can be known about God is plain to them. Well, who's them? He's referring to the Gentiles here. And Gentiles was another word for unbelievers in that day. And so when, when Paul was talking about those who have never heard the gospel, he, he would refer to them as Gentiles because that's, that was the people who were outside of the special revelation of God. And so for him to say, well, all that can be known about God is plain to them. Well, if God is good and all that can be known about God is plain to them, then yes, God's goodness is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are all without excuse. And so I, I would just point to those, to that as to say, yes, God's goodness is plainly revealed to those who remain in unbelief and the wrath of God remains on them. Why? Because they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They refuse to believe the righteous live by faith. Verse 17, the unrighteous suppress the truth in unbelief and they continue to remain under his wrath and they grow defiled in their thinking. And that's when it describes all these horrendous, heinous things that they begin to do because once they grow calloused and hardened, they become more and more sinful and God eventually gives them over to the lust of their flesh. And that's the hardening of their heart. Um, they're not born already completely hardened and cut off. Yeah. They can become that way if they continue to reject and run from God. And if, if people agree, if Calvinists agree that there are people who are more wicked than others, who are you know more sinful than other people, um, then you have to say that you're not born that way because you get worse. If you get more sinful and fall, you, you can't say that you're born that way. You're born in sin, of course, from the Psalter. You know, you're born in sin, but it doesn't say you're born, you're born hated by God, hated by God. And God hates you. God hates you. And you hate God. And you hate That's, God. That, well, That's, that, well, I mean, I mean, God hates the wicked. The wicked. You're born in sin. Born in sin. Well, God, God, well, God, 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 God must hate you then. Then why did He die for sinners if He hated them? Like complete, like in a, in a full, full on sense. Like hated, doesn't love you whatsoever. Would rather you keep sinning than you not sin. Like Ezekiel says. Um, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, I mean, I'm being told um, that I've got some reverb when I'm not muted um, my mic, and so I'm not sure why that is. That's why I got this <laughs> the headset? Xbox headset. <laughs> yeah, to try to avoid that kind of thing. So I'm not sure. Well, I'm not why. hearing you, uh, or I'm not hearing myself anymore after you moved the computer. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Again, I, I, the side chat guys are just saying there's some reverb. Um, and I, you have to mute. I have to mute myself to stop the reverb. And I'm sorry about that. I, I'm not sure why that has to happen that way. I, I don't know if it's something in the settings of my computer or or what. But um, I muted you know, my mic. Does it work? Yeah, yeah. I think it helps. Anytime we're not talking, we'll just try to mute our mics, and that may help with the, the sound. But um, but it sounds. He says like he says. He says we're hearing Kevin through your mic. Um, I don't know how that's possible when this is connected this way. I, I don't know how you could possibly be hearing him through my microphone. Um, but apparently that's, that is what's happening somehow. So um, anyway, um, you know, to answer the question um, that was raised in Romans one, you know, why do, why do the atheists um, refuse to accept the goodness of God revealed through creation? Well, there's two answers. There's one of two answers to that. Either, well, because God created them that way and they couldn't do otherwise, which is what the Calvinist system ultimately has to say, because they were fallen by God's decree. They were made in such a way that they would only hate God and reject him because God rejected them. And that's, that's the answer that the Calvinists would have to give if they're consistent, though they may want to paint it up and make it sound nicer than that. That's ultimately what they have to say. Or you say what we say, and we, we say that they suppress the truth 
by their own choosing, even though they could have done otherwise. In other words, they have no excuse. They could have accepted the truth. They could have believed. Doesn't mean they were perfect or, or they didn't fall short of God's glory. Even those who uh, believe and have, you know, believe in God are still unrighteous by the means of the law. They're declared righteous by grace through their faith. And so um, I, I would say the second answer is a more biblical answer. And, and ultimately it makes them even more condemnable because they could have done otherwise. And yet, even though God provided for them, even though God lifted the serpent in the desert, so to speak, he lifted the sun so as to provide for their means of atonement. They refused that gift. They refused that truth. And they uh, have grown calloused and hardened in their understanding. And I think that that's, that's essential for us to understand. And of course, the next thing that a Calvinist normally will go to is Romans 8. Um, they can't submit to God's law as if proof that you can't submit to God's law means you can't believe in the one who did. So somehow if they prove you can't fulfill the demands of God's law, then you also can't trust in the Christ who did fulfill the demands of the law. And again, that's just the conflation of the Calvinists. And that's the typical way they, uh, they kind of flow through their arguments, which all of them, you know, have answers to them. If people are studied enough to understand the, the distinctions between our particular perspectives. And I, I watched your, uh, your your podcast on that on the on the Romans eight one. Um, so you can't please God. Those who are in the flesh can't please God. Um, well, that's that's the whole appeal of the gospel. Um, you can't please God in your believe in Jesus. You can't please God. So put your faith in Jesus, so you can please God. That's the whole gospel thing, isn't it? Like. You can't please God. You can't do anything whatsoever to do to please God unless you put your faith in Jesus. So put your faith in Jesus. It doesn't say you can't put your faith in Jesus so as to please God. That's, that's the whole appeal of the gospel. Believe in Jesus so that you can please God. Um, yeah, it, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, <laughs> and the, the argument that continues in the side chat is, well, doesn't God command you to believe? And so what they do is say, okay, so look, God commands you to keep the law and we can't do that. He also commands you to repent for your inability to keep the law and trust in Christ. So that must mean you can't do that either. So that, that's, that's the Calvinist reasoning. God says, keep the entire law and we can't do that. He also says, trust in Christ and admit, confess your inability to keep the entire law. So it must mean you can't do that either. Does that follow? It's a non sequitur. Just does not follow. Just because you cannot keep the demands of the law does not mean you cannot confess that fact and trust in the one who did, which is exactly what the young man in the side chat has done here by saying, okay, well, look, God says, believe. That's a command. And we can't follow God's commands. The Bible doesn't say that you can't follow God's commands. The Bible says that you can't fulfill the law, that you can't always follow his commands in the sufficient enough way to earn or merit your righteousness. In fact, the law wasn't even sent for that purpose. The law was not sent for you to merit your salvation. The law was sent for you to be able to recognize your need for Christ. And is it sufficient to do that? On Calvinism, no, not unless you're regenerated. On our view, the law is sufficient to do that for anyone and everyone because the law, whether written on our hearts through a conscience or presented through Moses, is sufficient to allow for us to see our need for a savior because that's what it was sent for the purpose of doing. And so the Calvinist is simply making the same uh, convolation, uh, con conflating the two issues of saying, well, because it's a command of God to believe and trust in Christ, that's the same as the law itself. And that's just um, non sequitur. It's just not, does not follow. Um. That's, I mean, because there's people who have not murdered people. You know, there's, there's people who haven't murdered people. Did they fulfill the whole law because they didn't kill anybody? That's one of the commandments. They, they obeyed one of the commandments their whole life. I mean, and, and just believing in Jesus is, <laughs> I mean, that's just one of the commandments. Uh, believe in Jesus. You know, if there's people who haven't murdered somebody their whole life, and that's one of the commandments, are, are they, you know, I mean, it makes no yeah. sense that you can't fulfill yeah. the whole law, therefore you can't believe in Jesus. 
that doesn't make any, it's just a non sequitur. Yeah. And, and that's, and that becomes part of the issue too, is that, you know, like Romans chapter three, especially um, where it's talking about no one's righteous. No, not one. Well, all of us can affirm. Yeah. No one's righteous. No, not one. Um, you know, we all affirm that, but righteous in accordance with what? In accordance with the law. No one keeps the entire law. No one follows the law completely. Yeah, yo, yo, you may not commit adultery, but hey, you may have looked upon a woman in lust, and that's the same as committing adultery, as, as Jesus kind of raises that bar. Why does he do that? So as to make you recognize your need for a savior, that the law or your own works of righteousness are not sufficient. No matter how hard you try, no matter how good you are, it's never enough to earn or merit your salvation. So what do you have to do? You have to trust in the one who did that for you. You put your trust in Christ. That's why in Romans 9, verse 30 and following, it's so evident in saying, those who pursued it through works did not attain it. They're striving. In other words, there's a pursuit there. But then he contrasts that, but those who pursue it through faith. So there's still a pursuit on this side too. They're pursuing it by faith. They have attained it. So those who are pursuing it by works, trying to earn it themselves, have not attained it. Those who are pursuing through faith have attained it. The Calvinist has said, well, because we can't pursue it by works and attain it, therefore we also could never want to pursue it by faith and attain it either. So both of those things are impossible unless God does some effectual or irresistible work of grace to make you do it. Why, why, why even do the cross then? Why not just effectually cause certain people to follow the commands of the law perfectly so as to maintain and earn their own righteousness then? Skip the middleman. Jesus doesn't need to die. You don't need that. You just, you just effectually cause people to follow your laws perfectly and voila, you have the you know, perfect you know, Christians that you wanted in the first place. And it, again, it, just, it makes no rational sense and it's certainly not an argument that follows. And that's the, the, the regeneration preceding faith thing. Like, okay, so everything in the New Testament is rooted in the Old Testament. The whole New Covenant is rooted in the, in the Old Testament. Um, is there anywhere in the Old Testament where somebody had to be regenerated in order to believe in Jesus? Was there, is there any scripture whatsoever that says uh, Abraham was credited righteousness, therefore he believed? Or was it Abraham believed God, therefore it was credited to him as righteous? David believed God. Jonah, the, Jonah is, is one of my, my favorite ones because um, Jonah went to Nineveh, and these were not the people of God. Nineveh was not the elect of God. Um, they weren't elect at, at all. But they believed Jonah, and it says they believed God, and they repented. Um, that's, that's similar to what we're supposed to do. They, it, even though these people aren't elect of God, God is still their God. You know, he's everybody's God. Um, where does it say that Jonah, like God came down and effectually caused them to believe him so that they repented? I mean, it's, there's no, and I'm told, we're, we're told we're arguing from silence when it comes to regeneration preceding faith. Actually, it's the other way around because there's no passage in Scripture whatsoever that says somebody is born again before they believe in Jesus. There's none of that anywhere at all whatsoever. It's all repentance that leads to life. You received Jesus and then it, they were granted the right to become the children of God. Look to the, look to the Son and you will be healed. There's... It is condi one thing. Unconditional election is a hypocritical anti lordship salvation. It's completely hypocrisy. Unconditional election is hypocritical anti lordship salvation. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I just need one verse that says somebody was regenerated before they, you know, believed in Jesus. I need it. Uh, good luck. You won't find it. It, <laughs> it doesn't exist. Um, as we've gone through, the closest thing they have, First John 5, 1, which we've already provided even Calvinistic exegetes who, who admit that that wasn't the intention of, of John's writing there in that passage. And so they, they just don't have uh, any, any uh, passage that supports this concept or I, our idea of, of unconditional, um, or excuse me, pre-faith regeneration. Um, 
it's interesting you brought up the the Old Testament. Um, this this verse was sent to me this morning by uh, Andrew uh, Keffer. Um, it says this out of Proverbs one twenty three: If you respond to my warning, then I will pour out my spirit on you and teach you my words. So li- listen to the if then statement. If you respond to my warnings, um, the King James Version says, um, if you turn, uh, excuse me, let me let me actually guess, turn turn you at my reproof is the way the, the King James version puts it. So that's, that's an idea of repenting or confessing your sins so as to, 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 to repent. So turn at my reproof and I will pour out my spirit unto you and I will make known my words to you. So there's an example within the old Testament um, of the, if then of, if you listen, if you confess, then my spirit will be poured out on you. Not, I will pour out my spirit on you so that you will, uh, you know, confess and believe. Um, that That's never the order within Scripture, as we've gone over on many broadcasts that clearly talk about, it's, you know, these things were written so that you may believe, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The order is belief so as to have life. It's never life so as to believe. Um, he, he says to uh, the, the Pharisees, Jesus says, um, you refuse to come to me so as to have life. Well, if Calvinist is true, he should have said, I've refused to give you life so that you would come to me. But it's just it's just the cart before the horse backwards every single time. And the, the only reason that a Calvinist would just ignore those passages or avoid those passages is to hold on to the tradition of their system because they're caught in that system and they have to defend it at all costs. And I think some of them have become, in a sense, hardened within a worldview, within a systematic worldview. And they have to defend it at all costs because that's their, their you know, maybe their little brotherhood, the way they, um, you know, the, the way that they have the lenses they have looked at the scriptures through for so long that whatever it takes to uh, to defend that, that's what needs to be done in order to make sure that it it stands that it holds water no matter what passages you bring to them. Even you can bring explicit text like uh, Ezekiel eighteen, where uh, it clearly says that. Um, that it's it's through confession and through repentance that one is given a new heart. Um, and why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Repent and live. There's a, there's the order of right there. Repent and live. Not I will make you alive so that you'll repent. It's just over and over again we see throughout Scripture the clear order of salvation. And so let's put some Calvinists on there. I, Paul Washer. If you like Paul Washer and you held on, you, you grab the system of Calvinism, the five points of Calvinism and regeneration preceding faith. Paul Washer does not agree that regeneration precedes faith. He does not agree that you're dead in sins and you can't do anything about it. He explicitly says it doesn't, I know people destroy this doctrine uh, that if you're dead in sins, you can't do anything about it. No, seek the Lord and you will find him. You can do something about it. That's Paul Washer. And Paul Washer uh, agrees that Jesus died for the sins of all people, and because that's the gospel he preaches. So, just before you latch onto the five points, realize that in that in that movie, Calvinist, they they had Paul Washer, and they were promoting the five points, right? And people would because they saw Paul Washer there, and they were promoting the five points. You would think Paul Washer agrees with the five points of Calvinism, but he does not. So just because don't, you don't have to hold on to the five-point systematic, especially limited atonement and regeneration preceding faith, to be a Calvinist. I'd rather you just push Calvinists away and just be a Christian. But other than that, you know. Yeah, and, and I don't have the specifics in front of me with Paul Washer. He's, he's considered probably a, a low form of Calvinist um, uh, you may be what, what some we would call an inconsistent Calvinist, like a Charles Spurgeon uh, kind of Calvinist, uh, uh, MacArthur esque, uh, depending on the whether you're talking early MacArthur or later MacArthur, because it seems as if to me MacArthur has become more consistent in his Calvinism over the years yes. than he was earlier in his writings and teachings. Um, I could be wrong on that, but that's my, that's my experience with listening and, and uh, having heard from him since I was a teenager. Um, 
19 or so when I first started reading and listening to him. Um, and so I, I, I just, you know, Paul Washer uh, is a ex- good example, I think, of most Baptist kind of Calvinists. Uh, David Platt, uh, Matt Chandler, uh, Tim Keller is that kind of a, of a Calvinist. Um, they're the kind of Calvinists that when talking about soteriology, they answer questions one way. And when we're talking about other doctrines and other points uh, that may be unrelated, they answer questions in a completely different way that seem to, at least on the surface, if nothing else, contradict what they said over here when talking about soteriology. And um, and we've played some of those before, especially, you know, Tim Keller, we did one and one that I'm thinking of is one on hell when he was at the Verifoss forum, I think it was, or something of that nature. And he's asked all these questions about hell and he's answering it, um, quoting from C.S. Lewis and Dante and others that very much hold to more of a perspective like us. And, and uh, you know, and, talking about how nobody's in hell that didn't want to be there and talking about how they didn't have to be there and uh, they could have chosen not to be there and all these other kinds of things. Um, and, and again, it's sometimes hard to unpack what the meanings of the different senses of the words, because within Calvinism, oftentimes they have double meanings. You know, they could say in one sense, God does desire this in one sense, he doesn't desire it. And so it, it's, in their mind, at least, it's perfectly logical and reasonable for them to say, uh, yes, we affirm that God does want the salvation of all people, while on the other hand saying um, that the reprobate um, are you know, rejected by God salvifically before the world began. And you just have to accept the quote-unquote mystery. I, I would call it a contradiction, but they may, may say it's just got to accept the mystery of all of that. And I, and I, I just say, no, you know, I, I don't think so. I don't think that the Bible says what you think it says with regard to those points of contention. So there's no reason to accept that quote unquote mystery, i.e. contradiction, um, unless I'm, I'm shown very convincing reasons why um, there's, there's no reason for me to adopt that systematic or that way of thinking. Um, so, and well, I think, okay. go, yeah, go ahead. I do one more thing and I'll let you go. Layton. Um, so I think one of the reasons why, uh, Calvinism or er, is because of the isolating of certain chapters of scripture and this <clears throat> and then going to another chapter which is talking about the same thing and that's you know systematic theology but what you need to do when, when you read the scripture is read the whole book so you have the whole book in your mind like if you read Ephesians read, read the whole book and and get it in your head before you start taking out that one chapter. You have to have it, it's all one book, and then read the one chapter with the whole book in your mind. So read the whole Bible through your one verse. And when you guys start doing that, reading whole books, um, and get that in your heart before you start, you know, going to that one chapter and hopping all over the place to uh, fulfill your doctrine. Um, and get that in your mind and you'll you'll see how much there's so much more in the scripture there's so many awesome things in the scripture that that open up and it's not just Romans 8 and Romans 9 and John 6 that's that's in Ephesians 1 that's not the whole of scripture um but read the whole book and keep that in your mind and you'll start seeing more stuff in the scripture because you'll hear from Calvinists a lot they will just continue to quote the same passages over and over and over and over and they're not going through the rest of the book. So you can, you know, learn more about, learn more, not just Calvinism. Um, just keep reading the whole book. You need to read more. Keep reading. Don't stop. Don't boil your faith down to five points. Read more. And you will even stay a Calvinist, agree with the five points, but read more. So you understand more of the scripture. It's unfathomable. The depths of scripture are amazing. Keep reading more. That's a good word and a good note to end on, a good encouragement that um, looking at the entire context is important. That's a part of our hermeneutic um, is understanding all that the author is saying about a particular topic, not just a a proof text here or there that uh, seemingly supports a, a particular way of thinking about God. Um, and the thing I always like to say, Kevin, and I know we, we may have talked about this, is there's one presumption you can bring to every text, and that is God is good. Uh, mm-hmm. He is a good God. 
And if, if your interpretation makes God unrecognizably good, in other words, you're calling him good, but at the same time saying, yeah, I know that looks really bad, but I'm going to call him good while at the same time describing something that's d- demonstrably or demonstrably bad. Um, that, that makes it uh, really hard to defend your, your worldview. Okay. And um, right I don't think it's necessary. Oh, well, then that's all I need to hear. So <laughs> <laughs> if, if N.T. Wright says demonstrably that doggone it, it must be good. I don't, I'm just ignoring the, the, the grammar police that get on to me then. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. uh, glad you told me that. I don't know if it's true or not. I haven't seen it for myself. I, 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 I'll send you a clip of him saying it if, if I can find it again. I heard it and I was like, oh, hey, hey there you go, N.T. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I needed. I, I, uh, you got a guy with a British, a smart guy with a British accent saying demonstrably. Right. That's all this old country right. boy from <laughs> Berlin, Texas needs. Right. I, I can I can deal with any critics then. So, but uh, Kevin, I appreciate your support of the ministry. I super appreciate um, you you sharing and rebroadcasting and all the things you do to help make God's love for every man, woman, boy, and girl known. Um, we are are helping to spread the good news of God's love for everybody. And, uh, and I appreciate you helping us do that, brother. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Uh, Jesus, I pray for our Calvinist friends, Lord, that your fruits would be known, Holy Spirit, and they would spread among our Calvinist friends and our traditionalist friends, Lord that we could see your fruits, joy, peace, and righteousness, and gentleness, and love, and humility. Lord, if anything, we should want to be more ripe in those areas, Lord. Help us, Lord. We need your help, Lord, to unify under your glorious name so that we can spread your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, my friend. Thanks for... Thanks for tuning in, all you in the side chat. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Appreciate all those. And Happy New Year to everyone as well. And uh, go go uh, spend some time with that uh, precious wife and that baby. I've seen them walk behind you a few times. Yeah. So go spend <laughs> some time right. with them, brother. God bless right. you. Blessings to you. Bye-bye.